open in prayer and then I'm going to share a brief word with you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for who you are and that everything that you freely did for us on the cross. Lord, I uphold everybody here in this room, every man, woman, and child. And I pray that every single one of us will leave changed and renewed today, leaving with the deeper revelation of how good you are and how what we have by your grace, that how your grace has given us everything that we need through the finished work of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, just uh, very briefly to introduce myself and my background, where my journey began was back in 1994 now, where my husband, Sean, was diagnosed as sterile. And he went to several different doctors and specialists. Actually, I think it was four specialists and three specialists and went through the test four different times, all with the same end result. Um, in fact, the doctor said, Sean, you are clinically sterile. There is nothing that you, we can do for you for you to produce children. So the only option you will have to have children is to go to IVF and use donor sperm. And then that way we can have children. Uh, but just for us, we really felt that we wanted our own biological children. We knew, yes, that was an option. We understood very well the facts. They were staring at us in the face. In fact, screaming at us in the face. But we got a hold of just a simple truth that Jesus is alive and still heals today. And I don't want to share that part of my journey today, but I just wanted to share very briefly with you because what happened, the result of just understanding who Jesus was, that produced four children in four and a half years. Amen. So it was such a miracle that when I was first pregnant, Sean uh, was sp speaking to his doctor, but he had like a broken ankle. Something happened in his foot. And so he was going through all these scans and tests with his ankle. And, and the doctor rang Sean to give him his test results. And he was so excited. We just found out that I was pregnant. And he said, guess what? Near it is pregnant. And he said, look, I want you to come into my office straight away, right now. And this doctor, if you understood him, he was an obstetrician as well as a gynecologist, a paediatrician as well as a GP. And I didn't go to see him because he always was like an hour too late. So I saw a woman doctor that he was off, his offsider. But anyway, Sean said he, he went up there and he walked straight in his office. He waited for him. He just lived down the road. And he said when he walked in there, on his table was all the test results. And he had them all out. And he said to Sean, he looked him in the eye and he said, Sean, this is not your child. It is impossible for you to father children. And I mean, I was quite, <laughs> what are you saying, you know? But like, I didn't even, he didn't even think that until later I had to explain that to him. You know, the doctor thinks that this is not your baby, you know, that, you know, crazy. But all our four children look like him. <laughs> all four of them. And there's no disputing that they are his children. I mean, I actually question if I'm the mother because they don't really look like me. <laughs> And I love how God does that because that's he just he's got the best sense of humor. But just through that journey that we've just come to know that absolutely nothing is impossible with God. Absolutely nothing. And we have seen so many healings and miracles take place in this area of infertility and miscarriage and, and other healing as well. We've just seen so many amazing things. We've seen babies raised from the dead in the womb. Babies that have died in the womb and we just pray and they come back to life. We've seen couples that have even had things wrong in their bodies and even parts surgically removed, but they're getting pregnant and they're having babies. And no, we've seen also tumours, cancerous tumours disappear. It's amazing that what God has done just through us conceiving four little babies and little did I know that when I gave birth to, my, birth to my first little miracle girl, that I gave birth to a ministry. And the Lord just really put on my heart just to share the goodness of God and how God is always ready, willing and able to show himself strong to us in our time of need. And I think there's just been so much that we've misunderstood in regards to healing and in regards to God's kingdom that it just puts this blockage in place 
But the true nature of the Father, we know is through Jesus. If you wanna know who the Father is, just look to Jesus. And Jesus showed us that He is always ready, willing and able to heal and show Himself strong. But the message that I really felt the Lord put on my heart to share with you today is that how healing and everything else pertaining to God's kingdom flows by grace. It's all by the grace of God. Now, you might have heard a lot about grace over the last few years. There's been amazing preachers and teachers that have start talking about grace in salvation, that how we are saved by grace through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, so that none of us can boast. And that is the gospel message, I mean. That is the gospel message, but that is also how we see everything pertaining to God's kingdom come and flow in our life. It is by grace. Through faith, it's a gift of God, not of works, so none of us can boast. Now, for the first part of my ministry, I would have got up here and said it's by faith. It's by faith. How you receive healing, how you're going to receive your breakthrough is by faith. But that's not what that scripture says. That scripture is in Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. We are saved, and that word saved in Greek, sozo, basically means to be made whole spirit, soul, and body. So we are made whole by grace through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, so that we can't boast. Now, just very simply, faith is the way of salvation, isn't it? It's how we enter into or how we respond to God's grace because it's not about your faith. If you think healing comes and flows by your faith, then how much faith do you need? How much faith do you need? Do you know if you've got enough? Faith simply means that we're trusting in Jesus' performance and not our own. Faith is the way of salvation. Don't we know that there's nothing that we can do to make ourselves righteous before God? It's a gift. We know Abraham believed God and it was accredited or gifted to him as righteousness, as a gift. As a gift, faith simply means to rest or to trust in Jesus and his performance. That's how we enter into salvation. So we are saved, which means we are made whole by grace through faith, through believing in Jesus. It's a gift of God, not of works, so that we can't boast. So I just felt I'd share up front what faith is. Because faith is simply that you are trusting in Jesus' performance and not your own. And that should never stop. I mean, so whether it's for healing, whether it's to see the supernatural, it's all about trusting Jesus. You know, I woke up at 3 a.m. this morning with just a scripture going through my head over and over again, and it's in Daniel 11. And it just simply says that those, those people who know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. And that just was quickened to me over and over again. And I really felt that God wanted me to share that with you. If you know Jesus, you will be strong and you will do great exploits. It's not about your faith. It's all about because you know Jesus, because you believe in Jesus. And that is good news. Because one thing he's shown me over the, what, 18 plus years of ministry is the only qualification that we need to see the supernatural is to know Jesus. That's the only qualification you need. Do you know that? What can we do in our flesh? I can't heal a big toe, a cracked nail, but Jesus in me can. It's not about me, it's about him. So, and he's shown me, it's, you know, after all these years of ministry, and I've learned a lot along the way, but the last few years, he keeps saying to me, you've got to unlearn everything you've learned. It's just all about me. It's all about me and I'm always ready, willing and able to show myself strong. Will you let me? Will you let me? And I believe as we come into that understanding that that is the nature of the Father, that He is always looking to show Himself strong, I think we will get ourselves out of the way and just come into agreement with that simple truth. Because I also believe that God wants to see you not only to experience healing and the supernatural, but to minister in it. You know, he all wants us all to do what Jesus did and greater. That's the whole reason why we were given the Holy Spirit. 
Didn't Jesus say that? It's beneficial for you that I go so I can send the um, another. And in Greek, it's, it means one just like me. And we know it's the spirit of Jesus himself who came on the day of Pentecost so that all who believe in Jesus are born again by the spirit of God, by the Holy Spirit himself who now lives and resides in us. Ephesians 1.13 says, when we believe, we were sealed with the spirit of promise who is the guarantee of our salvation. That the spirit of Jesus that lives in us is the same spirit that anointed Jesus when he did all the signs and the wonders and the miracles here on earth. Amen. And I believe as the church gets a hold of who we are in Christ and also who he is in us, we are going to be dangerous. We are going to be dangerous. And it's time, I really believe. But the message that I wanted to share here is on grace and how everything flows by grace. But I first wanted to clarify what grace is because I think what many people understand grace to mean is just God's kindness or favour or undeserved favour. But it's so much more. God's grace to us and God's goodness to us is so much more. So I hope you don't mind. I'm going to do a little bit of a teaching here this morning. I'm going to share some scriptures with you as well. In Strong's Concordance, when you look up the word grace, it means grace, favour or kindness. But the definition that Strong's gives, it says that it's a gift or blessing brought to man by Jesus Christ. And in the Helps Word Studies, it says that grace is the leaning towards to share a benefit. It's preeminently used of the Lord's favour. God freely extended to give himself away to people because he is always leaning toward them. Now we understand that for salvation, don't we? We understand that salvation is all about what God did for us. Yes, do we agree with that? It's all about Jesus, what he freely did for us. And my favourite scripture that I believe that just really spells this out is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm going to read verses 18 to 19 in the Amplified Bible, because I believe this is the gospel in the nutshell. Verse 17 simply says that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So verses 18 to 19 says, all things are from God, who through Jesus Christ reconciled us to himself, received us into favour, brought us into harmony with himself and gave to us the ministry of reconciliation that by word and deed we might aim to bring others into harmony with him. This is my favourite, verse 19. Listen to this. It was God personally present in Christ, reconciling and restoring the world to favour with himself, not counting up and holding against men their trespasses against them, but cancelling them and committing to us the message of reconciliation, which is the restoration to favour. I love the Amplified Bible. I've got another pastor friend that calls the Amplified Bible the girly Bible because of the many words. But I love it how it just expands all the meanings of all those words. That how it was God personally present in Christ, reconciling and restoring the world to favour with himself. I mean, that's the good news, isn't it? that God couldn't find anybody to do it. So he said, you know what? I'm going to have to come down as myself and make everything right. That is the gospel, that God did it himself freely as a gift. You know, we, do we understand that Jesus was God in the flesh? Yes. Hebrews 1.3 says that, that Jesus was the exact representation of the Father. The exact representation, I think, and another version says that he was the sole expression of the glory of God. The glory of God came down and tabernacled in the flesh of Jesus. I mean, I get excited when I, when I start reading scriptures on that, that Jesus was God in the flesh, that Jesus did it all the work for us, 
You know, our new covenant, it's so exciting because it's not b- between us and God, between, but between God and himself, between God and Jesus, which means that we can't stuff that up. We can't break that because it's not dependent on us. It's all dependent on Jesus. And that's, I'll share it again in Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. We are saved, which means made whole by grace through believing in Jesus. It's a gift of God, not of works, so that none of us can boast. Healing flows the same way. Seeing the supernatural, the signs and the wonders and the miracles all flow the same way. By the grace of God as a gift. How you see it flow and outwork in your life is through simply believing in Jesus. Believing in Jesus. And if you believe in Jesus, you are already qualified. Amen? Amen. That is the good news. Now, grace So grace is essentially, as I just shared in in this scripture, it's God coming down and doing all the work for us. So whenever you see the word grace in scripture, put that into that scripture. Grace is God freely doing all the work for us. And grace is not just favour or kindness. Grace is the ministry and the person of Jesus It's all about Jesus. So when you see the word grace, it's not just God's kindness or favour. It's everything of who Jesus is and what he has freely done for us through his finished work on the cross. And we know it's he did all the work. You did nothing, did you? What can you do to save yourself? Nothing except to believe in Jesus, to trust in Jesus. It's not about your performance So why, after salvation, do we get into works and trying to to work and earn, to perform, to receive favour from God? When salvation never came that way, salvation came only by believing in Jesus. You know, the Apostle Paul said many times, the just or the righteous shall live by faith. Our lifestyle as a believer should daily be by faith, which not by our faith, by what I can do and by what I believe, but because I believe in Jesus, but because I trust and I rest that Jesus' finished work was enough for me, that I now no longer have to do anything to add to that work. Jesus' last words on that cross was, it is finished. Not to be completed or added to or or perfected or because it was already perfected. It was a complete and perfect and finished work. And I really believe as we understand as believers what that finished work is and how that pertains to every area of our life, it's going to make us free. Jesus said, when you know the truth, it will make you free. Because when you know that Jesus has already done everything for you, everything that can possibly be done was done through his finished work, it's going to make you free. And it's also going to make you realise that all the things that we're begging and asking God for, that we already have. For years, I prayed and begged God for healing. For years, I cried out and prayed and fasted. And I realised when I started reading my Bible that, you know, and God showed me that you're waiting on me, but I'm waiting on you to partake in what I've already done through the finished work. He's already sent forth his word and healed us. He already sent forth Jesus. When Jesus hung on that cross 2,000 plus years ago, he paid the price not only for your sin, but also for all sickness and disease. We just discerned the Lord's body. We just reminded ourselves as we partook in communion earlier of what Jesus has done for us. Jesus doesn't need to shed one more drop of blood for the forgiveness of your sins. He doesn't need to take one more stripe for your healing because it was done and perfected and completed 2,000 years ago. We need to remember that we are post-cross. We are no longer, you know, can read the Bible and a lot of people get misunder- misunderstand some of the things in, in the Bible. And I think a lot of believers are looking towards the cross and walking towards the cross. But we are post-cross. We are walking from Jesus' finished work. We're not walking towards forgiveness, church. We're walking from forgiveness because of what Jesus has done. 
In the same way, we're not walking towards healing as Jesus is going to do something for us. We're walking from the finished work of Jesus. We're walking from healing. Healing is not a promise. It's a provision. Forgiveness isn't a promise. It's a provision. It was provided freely for us by the grace of God. When the grace of God is Jesus, who he is and what he has freely done for us. God doing it all for us. That is the grace of God. It's a gift, not of works, so that none of us can boast. And the main scripture that I want to share on with this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 9 is the key, but to do this justice, I'm going to have to read the surrounding passages. And, and when the Lord showed me this passage to share on, at first I said, I'm not going to be sharing on this because it can open up a whole lot of can of worms. And as I share it, I think you'll understand. But I really felt God wanted me to share and rightly divide this scripture for you this morning just to show you how good God is. And this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 9. And this is the Apostle Paul. And he said, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, and this is my key scripture, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And so what does Paul say? Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, I love this passage of Scripture. To me, this is a positive, that my grace, who Jesus is and what he has done for you is sufficient for you. For my power, or my, it says he is strength in the New King James, but that word is dunamis in the Greek, the miracle working power. For my miracle working power is made perfect, which means complete and bring to an end in your weakness. And that's why Paul can say, therefore, I'm going to boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ can rest, which means abide permanently in me. It is good news. This passage is good news. But if you were like me and how I was raised and I was, what I was taught here, that's probably not how you are hearing this message because how we, I believe that how we've all been, um, as we read it on face value, is Paul is asking God three times to, he's praying for healing. And then the Lord's saying, oh no, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. So pretty much it's your cross to bear, Paul. And so Paul goes, great, well, I'll just suffer this condition. But this is not what this scripture is saying. And I didn't want to talk about Paul's thorn today, but because I, this is the key scripture God gave me, I feel I really need to, to do this justice. And just to share with you, this is not, Paul was not suffering with a sickness or a disease. Where it says in verse 9 and verse 10, where God says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength or my power is made perfect in weakness, then Paul says, therefore, most gladly, I'd rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, that word infirmities in the Greek is the exact same word for weakness. And if you look at other translations, they tr translate that second word into weaknesses, which is how it's meant to be, not infirmities. I don't know why the translated it's put that as infirmities there. Now, where's my notes here? Because in Romans 8.26... Listen to this, because this word weakness that's in here in 2 Corinthians 12 is the same word. And it says, likewise, and this is Paul again, likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. Same word. Not infirmities, not sickness or disease, but infirmities. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So the context there is the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. And here it's the inability to know what to pray as we ought. But the Holy Spirit helps us. 
So going back to the thorn, the Holy Spirit is the helper who helps you in weakness, not to you know, suffer and to bear it. And let me say, the Father doesn't want anybody to suffer with the very things that Jesus has redeemed us from. The cross is not a burden to bear, but it is a point of victory for the believer. To us, the cross is a point of resurrection and life with all its benefits and its privileges. Amen? The cross to me is good news. The cross to me is new life in Christ, where I can partake of everything that he freely purchased for me. Now, let me share some scriptures with you. Remember, Paul was a scriptorian. He was very well versed in the Old Testament language. And listen to this. Numbers 33 verses 55 says, But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come about that those whom you let remain of them will become as pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and they will trouble you in the land which you live. Joshua 23, 13 says, Know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you, but they shall be snares and traps to you and scourges on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. And the last one is Judges 2, 3, and there are a couple more. Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare to you. In all these scriptures, the thorn in the flesh or the thorns in the eyes or in the sides are people groups. They are, it's not literally a Canaanite sticking out of your side. Okay, they're an irritant. There's something that's sent to harass you, to hinder you. And we know that is true with Paul. You know, and if you haven't any, any understanding of scripture, I've got a hold of a great book a few years ago called Figures of Speech Used in the Bible, and that's by um, E.W. Bullinger. A great book. And there are over 217 known figures of speech in the Bible. A thorn in the flesh is a figure of speech. And it doesn't represent sickness and disease here or anywhere else. Today, in our language, we would say a pain in the neck. Okay? Oh, so-and-so, they're such a pain in the neck. Are we saying we're suffering with a sickness or a disease? No. It's a figure of speech. And if you look at Paul's life, everywhere he went, he was harassed. He was harassed, what for? For spreading the gospel. But as we know, we don't just read one passage of scripture and build doctrines on it. You've got to read the whole Bible. But also it's pretty good to read the book of Acts too, just to have a look at what Paul was doing in ministry. But also the surrounding passages, because if this is 2 Corinthians chapter 12. If you read chapter 11, it's got a great big list of all the weaknesses or infirmities that Paul faced. He was in perils, he was in shipwrecks, he was in hunger, he was in thirst, he was beaten, he was stoned, and that's not drugs. <laughs> he, he had big rocks thrown at him to kill him. You know, I mean, today, if, if our youth saw that he was stoned, they go, yay, Paul, you know. <laughs> but that being stoned in the Bible times was something completely different. So there are cultural figures of speech as well. But uh, that's not the point of my message. But I just wanted to bring that to attention, to share that with you. Because that Paul faced a lot of things, but it was all persecution for spreading the gospel. And if we look at this here in verse, I'll read again, verse 7. He says, unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan sent to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Again, people. Satan is using people to harass Paul. What for? To stop him from presenting the gospel of grace. Paul brought in grace. He was greatly known for preaching to all the Judaizers that were trying to bring people back under the law to preach about grace, about Jesus. No, you can't save yourself. It's not about observing the law and trying to fulfill the law. Jesus fulfilled it perfectly for you. Salvation comes only by faith. 
The righteous comes only. You live by faith, which means by believing and trusting and resting in Jesus' performance and not your own. And he fought hard for that. So this was not a sickness and disease. Just very quickly, if you're well-versed in the Bible, you might be thinking there's two other accounts with Paul, both in Galatians. One in Galatians 4, where Paul mentions, he says in the second part of verse 15, he goes, I bear witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. And so many people believe that he had some sort of eye condition. But once again, this is a figure of speech. Eyes were very important as they are today. Today, we would say, I would give you the shirt off my back. Okay, he's saying, you would have given me your eyes, something important you would have given to me. And I don't have time to go through this today, but I felt it was worth mentioning if you were thinking on this. And also in Galatians 6, verses 11, Paul says, see with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. And so some people say, see, he had an eye condition and he had to write with big writing. But that's, again, it's another, you know, type or a, a emphasis that Paul is trying to make. See, Paul had scribes that used to write all his letters, the majority of his letters. But here he's saying, look, I am writing this with my own hand. You know, we could say today, look how big and how messy. I'm trying to emphasize my point here to you. So I'm going to write it myself to prove my point to you. So it doesn't necessarily mean that he had an eye disease. And as I shared, the thorn in the flesh, it says what it is, a messenger of Satan sent to buffet Paul, lest he be exalted above measure. And so three times, Paul is praying to God to deal with the devil. You will find not one scripture in the New Testament where it says to pray to God to deal with the devil. In fact, you find the opposite in Luke 10, 19. Jesus says, Behold, I give you power to tread and trample on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing by any means shall harm you. Colossians 1, 13 to 14, it says that we have been delivered out of the control and dominion of darkness and we have been transferred or translated into the kingdom of God where we have redemption, which means the forgiveness of sins. We know through Jesus' finished work, he disarmed the devil on the cross. He disarmed him. He defeated him on the cross. Jesus put death to death for us, so all who believe in him shall live. Amen? Amen. So Paul essentially was praying three times to deal with this thorn, and I've already mentioned it to you, they were as the figure of speech, people sent to harass Paul. Wherever he went, he was harassed for spreading the gospel. Now, that's one thing in the Bible that we are pretty much assured of what we're going to experience. If we are going to preach Jesus today and the good news of the gospel, there will be persecution. Absolutely. But that is not a sickness or a disease. It's not sickness or a disease. It's just, and half the time, it's other Believers frustrating you, you know, you look at Paul. It wasn't so much the unbelievers, it was the religious rulers of the day that are against him. There were unbelievers as well as you read through the book of Acts. But this is what the thorn was. He's saying, God, you know, three times I beg with God. And what did God say? Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. What's grace? God having done all the work for us through Jesus' finished work. There's one consistent gospel message, and that makes sense, doesn't it? Paul, my grace, what I've already freely done for you through Jesus' finished work is enough for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. So then Paul can go, oh, Therefore, most gladly, I'd rather boast in my weakness that the power of Christ may rest upon me. But there's more that I want to show you here. The word sufficient, a great and powerful word. If you look up that word sufficient in Greek, sufficient in Strong's means to assist and to suffice. It is a primary root word and it means it can mean to be content, sufficient and be enough. But Strong's defines this word to mean to be possessed of unfailing strength. 
That word sufficient means, and this is strong, Strong's concordance says, to be possessed of unfailing strength, to be strong, suffice, enough, defend or ward off. And it is very closely related to another Greek word, which is pronounced aero, which means to lift up, take away and remove. And Strong says it's, it says it's comparable to this word aero. And this word aero is found in John chapter 1, verse 29, where John the Baptist, when seeing Jesus, says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away, that's that word aero, the sins of the world. Aero, to remove, to take away, to ward off. So sufficient, we look at these words in English and as I mentioned to you, we think when God says to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, we think it's a passive, don't we? But it's not, it's a powerful declaration. Hey Paul, what Jesus has done is more than enough for you. So let me put that as I read out, my grace is sufficient for you in with what that word grace means and what sufficient means. Therefore, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is my perfect, and weakness means my grace, my ability. What I did through Jesus' finished work is enough for you to be possessed of unfailing strength, to defend, ward off, and remove this thorn in the flesh, or messenger of Satan. Amen? I mean, doesn't that line up with the gospel as we know as a whole of who we are and what we have in God's kingdom? Jesus is more than enough. God's grace, what he's done for us is more than enough for us to walk in victory in every area of life. We have everything we need in Jesus, everything it will, as I mentioned before, it's a perfect, complete and finished work. And as a church, as we understand what he's done already for us, understanding who we are in the kingdom. You know, Ephesians 2 verse 6 says, we are seated with him in heavenly places. Now, we are seated with Jesus now. We are joint heirs with Jesus so we need to understand our position in the kingdom, but also understand who he, he is in us. Jesus, the spirit of Jesus, Romans 8, 11 says, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead dwells in us. Did you know that? Paul says that, Romans 8, 11. He said, the spirit that rose Jesus from the dead dwells in you. And because that spirit that rose Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will bring life to your mortal body. He'll bring life to you. The Spirit of God lives in you. When Jesus left, he didn't leave us here as orphans. He sent the Spirit, the promised Spirit. The kingdom of God is in you. Jesus said when the Pharisees were mocking Jesus, because all he talked about was the kingdom, that was twofold, about the kingdom praying, the kingdom shall come, but also the millennial kingdom that will come in the future. But the Pharisees mocked him and said, well, Jesus, show us the kingdom. Where's the kingdom? And he said, but the kingdom is not a place that you can say, look, here it is. It's over here or look over there. Because he says, for the kingdom of God is in you. And the Apostle Paul says the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God rather is not a matter of eating and drinking but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is in you. Righteousness, peace and joy of the Spirit because it's all of the Spirit is in you. And they are three supernatural, I believe, a part of God's blessings that we have resident within us as believers, that we can lay hold of the righteousness of God. It's not our righteousness, is it? It's Jesus' righteousness that was freely imputed to us because we believe in him. It's a gift. It's a gift. We can lay hold of the righteousness of God, the peace of God. The peace of God is Jesus. He is the Prince of Peace. But that word peace, if you understand in Hebrew, we get the word shalom. It means perfect completeness and soundness and wholeness. It means to be complete totally in every area of your life. We have that within us by the spirit of Jesus. And joy, joy. We have the joy of the Lord as our strength. And I believe those three things, righteousness, peace and joy, can totally transform every single area of our life. 
Absolutely. So that's what I really felt to share with you today, that by God's grace, by it's who, what God has already done for us through Jesus' finished work, it is enough for us. It's sufficient. It's enough for us to be filled with surpassing strength, to be able to overcome everything we face in life. Look at what else the Apostle Paul says. In 1 Corinthians 15, 57, he says, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 2, 14, he says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us to triumph in Christ. Is this a man that feels like he's overcome here? Not at all. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, he says, And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. What Jesus did, who he is, and what he has done is more than enough for us to experience any victory in any area of life. By the grace of God, as a gift, not of works, so that none of us can boast. And one of the last scriptures I want to share with you is Philippians 4.13. And the New King James simply says, this is Paul again, who says, I can do all things in Christ who gives me strength. Now listen to this in the Amplified Bible. He says, I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Isn't that good news? Does that sound like someone that was overcome? Paul got a revelation of God's grace and he had everything he needed by the grace of God, that God's grace was more than enough for him to walk in victory in this situation. And so I'm gonna read verse nine and 10 again. As God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So Paul goes, therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And then verse 10, he says, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. And that word infirmities is also weaknesses, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And he just shared what the, the weakness was, what the thorn was, in the pleasure, in infirmities, in, which is weaknesses, reproaches, in needs, persecution, in distress, for Christ's sake. Not once was a sickness or a disease mentioned there. So how you are going to see the supernatural or healing, whatever you need, flow in your life, is by grace through faith. Just like Paul, where you can come to the end of yourself. Let me tell you, if you've been struggling to get a breakthrough in your life with healing, let me encourage you, please come to the end of yourself and what you can do. Come to the end of what you can do. I know myself many times, I've gone on prayer vigils. I've fasted till I've lost so much weight. It was scary. I'm not against praying or fasting. Please don't misunderstand me. But if the focus is on you trying to get God to move or you're trying to earn from God, it's the wrong focus. Remember, God already moved 2,000 years ago. The provision is already there. We pray and we fast. That moves us into what God has already freely done for us. But if you're on this pathway of working towards it or trying to earn from God, you're going to wear yourself out. I've done it. I've crashed many times. I would go on this treadmill trying to pray and believe hard enough and try hard enough to get my breakthrough. And what would happen was I'd come to the end of myself where I felt like I had nothing left to give. I'd come to the end of myself, but you know what I did? Get back up and go back on the same treadmill. And the Lord showed me. One day I said, God, I've got nothing left to give. I can't do this anymore. And I just heard him say, oh, good, good. Will you let me? Will you let me? And God is looking to show himself strong to you. He, he is looking. God cannot withhold what he's already done. He can't take back what he's already freely gave to us through Jesus. Do you understand that? 
He can't take it back. It's already done. He can't withhold what's already freely been given. It's yours. The provision is yours in Jesus. It's a gift. It has to be based on a gift. If you're going to work for it, then it's based on what you can do. And you will only earn to the level of what you can keep up or what you feel you can earn. But it's a gift and it's free. And I have seen so many people healed sitting in their seats. No, no one's laid hands on them. And the Lord's even shown me that just in our ministry the last few years, that just to come and because we've got nothing in ourselves. It's all by the Spirit of God. He says, you lay hands on them, I'll bring the recovery. It's not about us. We just do what God says and he does the rest. And if you know that, it's really good because you can get yourself out of the way. You don't have to be on your game all the time. You don't have to be prayed up all the time. And please don't misunderstand me. I was a very works-based person that I felt that all my praying and everything I did qualified me to see healing. And I had four children in four years and I used to lecture in a healing school and I fasted and prayed a lot and I still fast and I still pray, please don't get me wrong. But where my mindset was, it was to work to earn or to try and get a level of the anointing. And then one day the twins were sick and they were rushed to hospital with a little stomach bug and I couldn't pray and I couldn't fast and Sean had to stay overnight with the twins and I had to come home and prepare my lecture. And I was really stressed because I thought, I can't get up and share the word of God tomorrow. I can't get, and get up and then pray for these people because I haven't had time to pray. I haven't had time to fast. And the Lord said to me, you know, just that still small voice. He said, why are you praying and fasting to get what you've already got? He said, my spirit lives in you. It's by the spirit of God that the signs and the wonders and the healings come. It's the spirit of God who is the anointing, not you. You can't work for it. You can't earn it. No, I have anointed you. I've called you. You get up, you open your mouth, and I'll anoint what you say. And from that moment on, I've seen people healed in their seats. Healed in their seats. It's not about, you don't need that any man lay hands on you necessarily. You know that? Because if you believe in Jesus, the same spirit that lives in me lives in you. The same spirit that anointed Jesus when he was here on this earth now lives in you. You need your breakthrough. You just say, thank you, Jesus. It's a gift of God, not of works, so that you can't boast. The fruit of the spirit, the supernatural, I'll close with this. The fruit of the spirit, I've digressed from my notes and I knew that it happened. Don't you spend all this time preparing a message and you know you get up here, God's going to quicken something to you. But I know it's a word of season, word in season for someone here. You know, one thing that, that God showed me, I struggled for years in an area of my life in self-control and, and um, the people at Grace have heard me share this little bit before. Um, and I just struggled with seeing self-control flowing in my life. And for the first five, 10 years of my Christian life, I would pray for self-control. And every day I'd pray, God, please, I need self-control. And then one day I got a revelation as I read Galatians 5.22 that I actually had self-control. So I spent another good five years trying to work self-control. Okay, how do I work self-control? How do I, I've already got self-control. What does this look like? What do I do with it? How do I make it work? We all do this, don't we? And I was struggling and struggling. Good for, I can kid you not, five years, eight tops, easy, going on my own way, trying to work self-control in this one area of my life. And then one day I just came again to the end of myself, sobbing in a mess, saying, God, I just don't get it. I can't make this self-control work. And he just quickened what the scripture says. It says the fruit of the, it, it's the fruit of the spirit. It's a fruit of the spirit, not a work of the flesh. Duh. <laughs> you can't, what you do in your flesh can't produce the fruit of the Spirit. He said to me, the Spirit of God lives in you. He's all, the Spirit of God, you already have self-control. It flows by relationship. From that moment on, I have not once had to worry about self-control. Never. It just flows with everything else. Healing it, through ministry, it flows. It's a fruit of the relationship that you have. It's by grace. By grace. And grace is by who Jesus is and what he has perfected and completed for you through his finished work. It's a gift of God, not of works, so you can't boast. Amen. Thank you, Lord.
Thank you, Lord. So all of those that are coming to the conference, it's a gift. And know that God's not withholding what he's already done. He's looking to get it to you. So let him, let him. I had a time in my life where I was just begging God for, I had a little miracle that was needed in my life, really serious, and I don't have time to go through it. And I was saying, God, please, I need this breakthrough. And he said, I remember just thinking, I'm just not in the headspace where I need to be. I'm just stressed. I shouldn't be in this headspace. And I thought, you know what, God, I can't do this. And again, I felt him say, good, will you let me? And I realized I'd gotten the way again, trying to work this healing, trying to make it happen, and the breakthrough happened. Now, I had a friend that was given three days to live. She had had three life-threatening conditions, had three days to live. The doctor sent her home to die. Her body was riddled with disease. She'd wake up every morning and she could not breathe. And she'd wake up and she, you know, in her natural mind would think, is this the day? Am I going to live another day? But you know what? There was a still small voice. Her name was Heidi. And he said, Heidi, get out of bed. That's all, nothing else, just get out of bed. And she'd go through this thing in her mind, but you don't know how it even hurts to breathe. Doctors are giving me three days to live. I'm in agony, I can't move. Her whole body was collapsing on itself. And she'd hear again, Heidi, get out of bed. She said, God, I can't. But she said, but I know in you, I can do all things in you. As she responded to that, she'd feel the pain leave her body. A supernatural strength would come. She'd go to work. That was five years ago. Five years ago. Isn't God good? He's looking to show himself strong. Let me close in prayer this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that we, you have already freely provided us with everything we need by the grace of God, by who Jesus is and what he freely purchased for us on that cross. Thank you for the finished work of Jesus. Father, I pray for this conference over these next few days and nights, Lord, that we will see many signs and wonders and miracles, that we will see many come into a saving knowledge of Jesus. Those for the first time receiving their salvation, but also those wanting to know him as saviour in the area of their health. Because in Psalm 91 verse 16, he says, with long life, I will satisfy you and show you my salvation. And Jesus, I thank you that you will show us your salvation through signs and wonders and healings and miracles so that all who are sick will receive a breakthrough and that glory upon glory will be given to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Just quickly, I feel there's, there's one or two people here and I feel that you are in pain in your body right now. And, and I'm just going to be led by the Spirit. But I just believe that just close your eyes if that's you. That the presence of God, we know the Spirit of God is in us. But I just feel right now that healing is going to manifest on your body right now. I command that pain to leave your body in the wonderful authority I have in Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, for your healing to manifest so perfect health and wholeness right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There's somebody else here who suffers with migraines. I feel you suffer with my headaches and with migraines. Right now, I pray for you if that's you. Just close your eyes. This is between you and Jesus. It's a gift of God, not of works. Just let him. Father, right now, I thank you, Lord, that migraines, those headaches will be no more. That your healing power will come right now and restore that person or those people to perfect health and wholeness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.